charge. Amen. I'm going to ask you, if you will, tonight to join me in the book of Philippians chapter 2. And um, I know many uh, different Bible makers lay their Bibles out a little bit differently. But um, the second chapter of Philippians in, in my Bible is broken up. And uh, as a few verses of each chapter, the subject changes. Uh, when we get to verse number 12 and verse number 13, where I'm going to be reading from tonight, uh, there is a heading, and it just says, shine as lights in the world. Amen. Or in other words, that's what those few scriptures are going to be talking about. And if there was ever a day, oh my goodness, that we need the light of the church to shine, it is certainly the day we're living in now. And so this little light of mine, why wouldn't we let it shine? Why wouldn't we let it reach as far and as wide as possible? Amen. The book of Philippians chapter 2 verses 12 and 13. Paul writing to the church at Philippi. He says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Amen. I, I realize that for some in this house tonight, Philippians 2 and 12, 13 is a pretty familiar passage of Scripture. But um, Paul is saying, I know you've always been an obedient body. Especially in my presence, when I've been with you, able to shepherd you hands on. But he said, but, but not just in my presence only, but now much more he speaks about in my absence. And then he teaches them and says this, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And tonight, my subject for just a little while uh, is these three words, your own salvation. Your own salvation. I don't want to preach too long tonight. I don't ever want to overstay a, a topic or anything. But I heard something a couple of days ago. A preacher said there's just a real thin line between a long sermon and a hostage situation. And uh, so I don't want this to turn into a hostage situation. But uh, let's just ask the Lord to touch us together. Would you do that? Lord, we love you. We are very thankful for the privilege that we have been given together to come together, Lord, in an appointed place, an appointed time. We're very thankful, God, that as always, you have met us, not just according to your promise because we are under contract, but you've met us here tonight, God, because you love us and you know that we love you. And so I ask you to touch this word, this anointed sword to our heart and help us to receive it in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and you may be seated. I would like to begin by stating that the phrase that's going to serve as the centerpiece of our topic tonight is work out your own salvation and not work for your own salvation. We can't do enough good things to be saved. And so what we're talking about here tonight is not something that would be humanly possible for you and I to massage or to manipulate into our own salvation, working for our own salvation. So I think to begin with, we have to understand that the Apostle Paul, and as with all epistles, is writing to the saints. And so to the saints, you will note in chapter 1, verse 1, those opening passages in these epistles, he is talking to the saints at Ephesus, or to the saints at Philippi, on and on. And so Paul is not reaching to sinners he is not speaking uh, to someone outside of the faith. He is talking to the church. So this means that Paul is addressing an audience much like mine tonight. Amen. Primarily made up of people that already have decided. You have cast your lot. As the song says with the chosen few. Amen. You have cast your lot and you said I'm going to live for the Lord. And so the phrase work out. Work out in this context means to work to full completion. Get everything out of this that you possibly can. Um, you know, there have been meals, perhaps, just to use an illustration, there have been 
uh, meals that, that we have all partaken of that have been so good, maybe even a particular dish of a meal, that it's so good that you don't want to just eat real fast. You want to just savor that moment. You, you want to get everything out of this that you possibly can. And, uh, and so this phrase, work out, that's what it is. It's, it's to get and make full completion. And so in, in Paul's day, this phrase would also be used in the context of working in a mine. And so if we can just sort of let our own minds kind of go down that vein. In other words, he was saying that you need to get everything out of this mind that you possibly can. Everything of value. You don't want to overlook anything. You want to get everything out that you possibly can. Or perhaps uh, many times biblical writers are speaking about uh, agriculture. Many times there's an agricultural thread that kind of runs through illustrations and, and uh, admonitions. And so not only to get everything out of a mind that you possibly could or if Paul was referring more in the lines of agriculture, he would be talking about working the field, getting everything that you possibly can out of the field. Several years ago when we cleaned up some trees out in, behind the, the church here, um, we wanted to plant grass. And so uh, the instructions were we needed to find out how the soil is. And uh, so I called to find out what we should do about that and how we would do. I had never personally done this, a soil sample. And uh, so the instructions were to get on one corner and to walk diagonally across that piece of property. And I can't remember now, three or four uh, Ziploc bags of dirt and you mark them because just because it needs something here doesn't mean it needs something there. And that they would do a soil sample and they would uh, analyze that and then they would come back with, uh, with, an, with a, the right ingredients, the proper thing to just go and buy. Now, we could have just guessed. And we could have just said, well, we, we think this would be right. And, and um, I can remember with great deference my Uncle Daniel, uh, when we were getting our yard and fertilizer, I said, what kind of fertilizer do you put on your yard? He said, 10, 10, 10. I said, okay, 10, 10, 10. So some of you are going to be able to relate to this. And so I went to the old feed mill. Many of you remember the man used to run the feed mill in town and sold fertilizer. And I said, uh, I need to get some fertilizer for my grass. And he said, all right, what do, you, what do you want? I said, 10, 10, 10. He said, who told you that? <laughs> and uh, he said, he just put his hand, he said, let, let me just pause. He said, you were talking to an older man, weren't you? I said, yes, sir, it was. It was my uncle. He said, he just laughed. He said, that's what I figured. He said, those old timers, just 10, 10, 10, that was just the, that's just what you did, 10, 10, 10. He said, but that's not what you need. He said, you need 16, 4, 8. It's going to have to be so much of this, so much of that, so much of the other. And so uh, I never told Uncle Daniel that story, and I've waited all this time to even share it publicly. But. <laughs> and so he, work in the field, you want to get everything that you possibly can out of it. And so if you want the greatest crop possible, then you want to get everything you can out of that field. And so I, I don't, I'm don't. i taking too much time with that, but I believe that, that the goal of, of us being filled with the Spirit of God is so that we can achieve this Christ-likeness. Amen. Now, tonight is Bible study. We're going to talk about what it takes to not only be saved, but to stay saved and what we should do after we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says in Romans 8 and 29 that we should be conformed into his image. And so we, how do you do that? Somebody needs to instruct us in those, in those measures. How do we do that? And so there are problems in life. Can I get a witness? There are, there are problems in life, but God will help us work them out and work through them. And so our lives have tremendous potential like a mine or like a field. There's a lot of potential there. So we want to get everything that we possibly can out of this. And I believe that God wants us, everyone, to reach the fullest potential that we all have. I've used this illustration countless 
times, and I'm not saying again tonight because I'm out of things to say, but as Brother J.T. Pugh said, the saddest thing that could ever happen in eternity is to get to heaven and be stood beside the person that we could have been. That's a very convicting thought and a very convicting statement. So to, to understand that God wants all of us and he wants to help us. He doesn't just demand, point his finger that we reach our maximum potential. He wants to help us reach our full potential. And so one of the many wonderful things about being filled with the Holy Ghost is to know that God has a plan for our life. God has a plan for my life. He has a plan for your life. He has a plan for your family. He has a plan for us individually, but he also has a plan for us collectively. And I find great hope in that. And so since God has a plan for our life, he will help us work that out for his glory. Now, if you will just pardon a personal illustration here, but today is a special day in the calendar year for my wife and I. And so early this morning, I looked at my wife and I said, happy anniversary. We had already talked about this day coming up, so she knew exactly what I was talking about. And she just smiled and she said, happy anniversary to you as well. But 37 years ago today, my wife and I stepped out by faith into full-time ministry. This was not a knee-jerk reaction. We didn't just get all fired up at the service one Friday night and we launched out Monday by no stretch of the imagination. This was a process of several years and it was most certainly done with our pastor's full blessing in, in our church. And, uh, but it was a huge step. It was a very huge step. And we had prayed and fasted and we had planned and prepared for this moment. Uh, we had our bills all paid up for several months in advance. And, uh, uh, but and, uh, but what, what we were looking at as a schedule wasn't very promising. But we knew that we were in the will of God and that God would somehow take care of it and he did. We knew we were in his will, and so God has never failed to take care of us. And so in our walk with God and in our walk in ministry with our case, our walk, our journey is not another person's journey. Amen. What God calls us to do or even, even how God calls us to do what we do, even if we're doing similar things in ministry or doing similar things in life, no one... No one has the same path, exact, the exact same path. I think that that's why the scripture admonishes us to run the race that is set before us. My race is not your race and your race is not mine. And uh, we can all take great consolation in that. I love the fact that, that God is a God of variety. Amen. No two flowers are the same. No two snowflakes are the same. God is a God of tremendous variety. And so if, if no two snowflakes are the same, we can rest assured that no two people or no two call, the calling of God on anybody is going to be the same. So I, I think that all of us must be like Christ, but we also must be like ourselves. God's going to use us as we are. That doesn't mean we shouldn't improve our serve. Doesn't mean we shouldn't improve our presentation and things of that nature. There's always room to grow, always room to grow, always room to get better. But I believe that we also must be determined to be ourselves because God wants to use you as you. Amen. I believe that Moses talked just like Moses talked after the burning bush. I think he talked the same way after the burning bush as he talked before the burning bush. I think Moses sounded exactly the same on this side of the Red Sea as he did the other side of the Red Sea. God used Moses and everyone else because he wanted them. He needed them in that time. And so I believe that we must be Christ-like, but we must be ourselves. And we should not be cheap imitations of anybody. And we shouldn't be cheap imitations of even great people. Amen. I'm thankful for every mentor. I'm thankful for every person that's ever challenged me today. I spent a good deal of time this afternoon just prayerfully in my mind and my heart thanking the Lord not for the, just the instructors in my life, but I'm thankful for the examples that you put in my life. And, and I've had the privilege, like many of you, had the privilege of having great people, wonderful people in my life, but God didn't call me to be like them, to mimic them, to parrot them. I think you know what I'm saying. He called me to be me. Let them polish and let them hone and let them teach. Amen. But we're to follow, uh, we are to follow only what we see of Christ in their lives, not just follow and mimic them. 
that makes sense? We just need to follow what we see of God in their lives. 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 says, Be followers of me, even also as I am of Christ. Amen. One, one man once aptly said, he said, Every great saint has feet of clay and ultimately may disappoint you, but Jesus Christ will never fail you. And so the greatest person walking the face of this earth right now Amen. They're just walking with clay feet. And they have the potential to disappoint us. They have the potential to let us down. I have the potential to disappoint you. You have the potential to disappoint me. And the list goes on and on. In Philippians 2, 14 and 15, Paul contrasts the life of the believer with the lives of those who live in the world. Unsaved people complain. And find fault. But the Bible teaches the church, the children of God, that we are to rejoice. Amen. We're not rejoicing because of all things, but we rejoice in all things. God can give us light and darkness. He can give us hope where there is uh, seemingly no hope to be found. Unsaved people complain. They find fault. Society around us can be twisted and distorted. And we could certainly say an, a hearty amen to that. But in the middle of this twisted and distorted world in which we live, God has a church that can stand up straight. Amen. We don't have to be bent by the winds of the society that we live in. Not because we're perfect. By no means not because we're perfect, but because we measure our lives by God's word. And God's word is a perfect standard. And so if we measure our lives by that, the world is dark. But the church is called to shine as light, a city that's set on a hill that can't be hid. The world has nothing to offer, but I believe the church and a child of God. So when I speak of the church, let's don't get comfortable and think that's just a foreign body somewhere else. But when I believe that you and I have the capacity in this dark world to hold out the word of life and the word of hope in a, in a time, in a season when it seems like the world has nothing to offer and cannot find what they're looking for, God is still speaking. He is still speaking. I was so encouraged just a couple of services ago uh, when somebody in our church was telling us about a lady that's a young lady that's been visiting here, our services the last few, the last few weeks on Sunday morning. And she, her testimony was this. She said, I was riding down 349, and when I rode past the church sign, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, this is where you need to go to church. Amen. She didn't come that Sunday, but she came the next Sunday and has come a few times since then. What I'm saying is the Spirit of God, amen, is still speaking the truth. Hallelujah. God, here's our hope. God is still speaking. Amen. We're not doubting that, but people are still listening and they're obeying the voice of God and the will of God. And so look up. Amen. Look up. Praise God. The world is dark, but there's light. The church has light. The world has nothing to offer, but the church is walking around. We're not scratching our head thinking we have nothing to offer as well. The church is holding forth a message of hope. In other words, as we allow God to achieve his purpose in our lives, then we become a better witness that the world desperately needs. Amen. The world desperately needs a better witness. And so we need to apply these characteristics to Jesus. And you'll see that he lived a perfect life in an imperfect world. Again, we're going to walk with, with, with feet of clay. I understand that. And I'm not talking about us being the epitome of perfection. But I believe that as we follow him, we can be conformed into his will. It is very important to note that the purpose is achieved in the midst of what this purpose was achieved in the midst of what Paul called a crooked and perverse generation. Amen. So where was the church? And they weren't hiding in the shadows. They weren't hiding in the dark. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, let the light and the hope of the church, amen, because we have God's word on our side. That is the light and our hope. Let it shine brighter than ever before. So Paul doesn't admonish us to retreat. He doesn't admonish us to go into some sort of spiritual isolation. That's not what he said at all. Amen. The church, a city set on a hill. Amen. We can't be hid. And so uh, he doesn't admonish us to run and hide. It's only as we are confronted with the needs and the real problems of life that we can begin to become more like Christ. You're going to have to be confronted with issues in life to know how to deal with issues. 
Amen. We, you're going to have to be confronted with falling to learn how to stand. You're going to have to be confronted with danger, with injury, in order to learn how to run. Those are all the risk, but the risk is worth it. There's a reward on the other side of that. The Pharisees had so isolated themselves, and they had so insulated themselves from the reality of this world that they developed within themselves an artificial self-righteousness. Amen. Ultimately, they were totally unlike the righteousness of God and unlike what God wanted them to be. And it all happened when they isolated and so vehemently insulated themselves against the rest of the world. And consequently, consequently, the Pharisees forced a religion of fear and they forced a religion of bondage upon people. And in the end, they crucified their only hope, Jesus Christ, their Messiah. And it happened because they said, we are not going to confront this. We're going to just gather to ourselves. We're going to create our own world, our own rules, and we're going to live by this. And ultimately, they ran aground and crucified their only hope. Amen. So therefore, it's not by leaving the world, but it's by ministering to it as we see God's purpose fulfilled in our lives. Amen. You know, uh, and I understand I don't, I, what I'm about to say, I say with great deference, please trust me in this. I, uh, I know that it was a frightening time. It was a frightening time for all. But in the throes, the early throes of COVID-19, I talked to many people who were hospitalized in that particular time when doctors, and I, I'm not being disrespectful, but, but when doctors were they themselves afraid to go into the room of their patients. And many of them stood at open doorways and communicated across the room. I'm, I'm not being disrespectful and I'm, and I'm not being critical because it was a very uncertain time and, and, and nobody knew the beginning from the end. And, uh, but to think about, to think about that for just a moment, is that the posture, the position that the church should have? With sin, because there's sin and darkness around, should we, should we distance ourselves from that and just try to peek around the corner and, and shove word to somebody that there's hope found here? I don't think that's the answer. Amen. I believe that, that, uh, that the call of the church, amen, is to let our light shine, amen, and minister as God has fulfilled and begins to fulfill his purpose in our lives. We all have a ministry. We all have something to do. And please, let me remind you tonight that the enemy would love nothing more than to discount your contribution to the ministry of this church. He would love nothing more to, than to discount and bring to the basement level a markdown price of your contribution. But can I tell you that God called you. He gave you the gift that you have. He gave you the ministry that you you have unique to you, unique to me. Amen. We need to understand the value of what God is wanting to work out and how he wants to use us in this very day. Amen. Our, our text this evening, that was my introduction, page nine. Amen. We're back to that hostage situation, aren't we? Our text this evening has a key phrase, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And so I just want to underline those three words, your own salvation. So as we consider these three words, I am struck as I begin to, to let these passages of Scripture just marinate in my heart and my mind. The, the Scripture so clearly says, work out your own salvation. And so as we consider those three words, as I consider those three words, I was, I was struck with a question and that question I pose to you tonight, and that is, what else in life can I call my own and really be accurate? My own. Work out your own salvation. I know of only one other commodity that I can truly call my own. According to Paul, I have my own salvation. But I also, the only other thing that I can think of that I truly own is my sin. David said, my sin is ever before me, ever before me. And so these two things are really the only two things that I could say 
I own those. They are really mine. Many other things we may all call or we may all say that we own them. But they may not be ours at all. I can freely talk about many things that I call my own. I can talk, I can talk about my rights. I can talk about my privacy. I can talk about my bank account. But the bank account is only going to be as good as the bank it's in. And if the bank fails, and history has proven that they can, so if bank fails, my investment will prove to be unreliable, and any profit I thought of having is going to instantly disappear. But a moment ago, I was calling that my money, my account, my bank. But it's really not mine. It's really not mine. I can talk about my rights, but they can be taken away. I can talk about my privacy, but it can certainly be infringed upon. We can talk about our property. I own this land. Well, just don't pay taxes. And you will figure out real quickly that we may not own that in the context of which we think we own that. We can talk about my house, or you can talk about your house. But a natural disaster or a fire could destroy a lifetime of work. I know that's a horrible thought, and I'm not trying to, to be negative here at all. But in moments, in absolute moments, it can all be taken away. Uh, just a few services ago, I mentioned a, a Pastor Hill in Indiana, uh, who uh, the, the, a few weeks ago when these... these uh, Tornadoes were going through the Midwest just out of nowhere. A tornado came, came upon them before there was any warning whatsoever. And they lost everything they owned. It was unbelievable. Their cars were upside down, down the road. It was just absolutely nuts to think about everything. And we could say, I own that. Well, that was his car upside down, trashed. That was his home, blown all over to oblivion. He made a video, I saw a video of that, and, and he was videoing a lot of the things that were laying around his property. He said, most of this, I don't even know who owns this. This wasn't the debris of their home. It looked like their home. He said, I don't even know what this stuff is. We don't know where this belongs. We don't know who this belongs to. And so we can talk about our friends. But through the years, I've lost some people. You've lost some people that you consider to be a friend. You thought they're there. They're my friends. And we can talk about our family. But we have watched time and circumstance or even accidents take members of our family. We could talk about our health. But again, time and circumstances can change all of that as well. Amen. I, I'm not here. I promise you that's as much of that as we're going. Amen. I don't think you can take much more. I'm not here tonight to try to throw a wet blanket over any hope that you may have, but I feel compelled to underline something tonight. Paul is saying that we own something, that we have something that a fire can't destroy, a storm can't blow away, uh, uh, an economic crisis can't devalue it to the ends of the earth, some sickness or terminal disease can't take it away, amen, some, some seed of discord can't take away the friend, amen, I'm here tonight to tell you that there's something that we can biblically call our own and that's what Paul said my salvation hallelujah we own something here tonight amen we own something my own salvation and so that same God that does not guarantee us financial security or permanent earthly friends he does not guarantee all of us a golden wedding anniversary amen but he says there is something that you do own there is something that you have and that is your salvation of course, there is a plan of salvation or there is a path to salvation. That path is found in Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. When we believe, when we repent, and when we are baptized in Jesus' name, that puts us in a position to receive the gift that God wants to bestow upon all mankind. Amen. The gift of the Holy Ghost. And it is with that we are given a New Testament right to say, I own something. My home can blow away. My car can be taken away. Amen. My, my health, my friends, my family, these things can be gone in a minute. But when it's all done, when the ash 
finally, the last ash finally falls to the earth. There's something I still have. I've got my salvation. I've got my walk with God. I've got the most important thing. Praise God. Amen. We're not saved by our, our own merit. We're not saved because we're hard workers. We're saved because it is, because it is the gift of God. Amen. So Paul tells these Philippians what to do with this great gift. So we have this gift, so what to do with this great gift. In verse 13, he said, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. In other words, in other words, Paul says, you have the power and the authority, so use it. Amen. You have the power You have the authority, so exercise that power and exercise that authority. And so if you know, if I know, we have some glaring flaw in our character, and we all should be eminently aware of character flaws. Amen? If a person, man or woman, has an unruly temper and you're full of the Holy Ghost, you know what you ought to do? You ought to do something about that. Because you have power. And you have authority. How long are you going to keep letting the devil make a fool of us? Amen. I've got to do something about that. I've got to do something about that. Amen. Whatever flaw it may be, we've got to do something about that. We must. But he's not just saying, go take care of that. The Lord said, I've given you authority. I've given you power to take care of that. Amen. I have a power working in me. The scripture says, to will and to do that which I never had access to before. I can change the character flaws that I have. I can change the hiccups that I have because I have the Spirit of God and that Spirit will help me to will and that Spirit will help me to do. And so here's the bottom line, that the value of a gift is only found in its use. The value of a gift is only found in its use. You can be given all manner of things, but if you just put it on a shelf, it won't matter. You've got to use it in order to really understand the value of it. So being born again is more than a philosophy. It's more than a religious ritual. Being born again is a living God. And here's what the scripture says, that worketh, W-O-R-K-E-T-H. E-T-H means the continuation that worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Paul says it will meet any test to which you put it. It can handle it. It can withstand it. It won't bend. It won't bow. Hallelujah. I want to I want to turn your attention now to 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read several verses here. And and the reason for doing so is because they're all interlinked. These are links in a chain. And so 2 Peter 1 and 5. The Bible says, And beside this, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue. To your virtue, knowledge, to your knowledge, temperance, and to your temperance, patience, and to your patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. And then verse 8, for if these things be in you and abound, hallelujah, they can't just be resident in you, they need to be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. What a powerful what a powerful lineup of promises. Amen. Just here's how you do it. You add and you add and you add and you add. And if you do these things, if you do this, you're going to have something that help, will help you stand the, the absolute test of time. We live in a day, sadly, but it is true. We live in a day where many, many people think the church or consider the church to be irrelevant. That's the truth. It's sad, but that that is the truth, especially a nation founded upon the principles of which our nation has been founded. Sadly, many churches, by and large, no longer even hold biblical convictions. And that is a very sad but very true statement. That's not what Jesus said of his church. But Jesus said of his church, he said, you could... I'm just using shirt sleeve language here, but I believe the scripture will back up the principle. You could build a church at the gate of hell. And the church can and can the church can see can succeed because the Bible says the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. 
It's not going to be so dark that the church is going to be in trouble because the church has the light. It's not going to be so hopeless that the church has no hope because we have God and God is hope in his word. Hallelujah. Amen. So if you will, for just a moment, consider with me the, the design of a sailboat. For that vessel, in order for that vessel to move forward, it's got to have someone to lift that main sail. You've got to lift it into the uncertainty of the wind. And so when you lift that sail, you don't really know what's going to happen because you're lifting, lifting it into the uncertainty of the wind. However, that huge sail has got to have something working in conjunction with it. Everyone can see the vessel and everyone can see the sail. Hallelujah. But beneath the reason there's a balance to this vessel... The reason this vessel can stay in the wind, even a prevailing wind, and stay upright is because beneath it is a deep-reaching center board. It plows beneath the water. Amen. That plow provides a tremendous and a much-needed leverage. And so the, when the vessel begins to feel the wind and the pressure blowing against it, amen, that keel or that center board beneath it in the water, that weighted centerboard, that's what's there. You can't see it. Nobody's going to brag about it. Nobody's going to talk about it. Nobody's going to ask to take pictures of it. But that is what's keeping everything upright. I want you to understand something tonight. Amen. We have something that we own. Our own salvation. I've got something in my heart. And yes, whenever life forces me to lift the sail into the uncertainty of the wind and I don't know which way life could take me tomorrow we don't know which way life could take us by the stroke of midnight tonight but here's a hope that we have that we've got something buried beneath the surface we've got something that's that, that is balanced it's going to keep this vessel of our heart and this vessel of our mind hallelujah the pressure above is going to be offset by the grip below hallelujah and so the pressure that we may feel in this world and the pressure we may feel blowing against us is not going to be intimidated by what's holding us underneath. That's why you're still here tonight. It's not because you haven't been tested. It's not because you've only been tested lightly. It's, it's not because you haven't stood in the waters that you thought were going to drown you. Hey, hey man, you're here tonight because there was something deep that was holding you a grip that when you thought I don't know if I can take one more gust of wind there was something that you owned brother Williams there was something in your heart you're here tonight we can lift our hands and our voices and magnify him I'm talking about your own salvation praise God it's greater than a song it's greater than a note on a musical instrument it's greater than a conference it's greater than a meeting it's greater than a revival it's greater than a single speaker hallelujah all of those things may blow out of our lives but there's something I have Praise God, my own salvation. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There will always be winds. And there will always be days and trials when, when our faith is put to the test. Amen. Because this is, not all, this is not about always winning. I know this is not a positive thing to talk about, but it is really the truth. Amen. This is not about always winning. Because sometimes the key to winning is found in the failing. A young banker once asked an older successful banker to share with him the secret of success in the banking industry. And so one man is on the sunset of his days in this industry. Another man is standing at the threshold of the sunrise of his days into the banking industry. And so he said, I just want you to share with me the, the, the keys to success in the financial world. He said, well, the older man looked at the young man and said, well, what you need to do is always make good decisions. So the young man says, well, how do you learn to make good decisions? He said, by making bad decisions. And so we're here tonight, still standing. You know why? Because we've fallen. <laughs> we've fallen a few times we've got the bruises and the scars and, and may even have a, little, a few bloody spots from recent falls but we just kept thinking 
in holding on to the hope of Micah. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, when I fall. I shall arise. And when I sit in darkness, God is going to be a light to me. How can we have that kind of mindset? How can we have that kind of faith? It's because we own something that cannot be taken away. The devil didn't give it. Amen. It's an old song, but it's still true. The devil didn't give it, and the devil can't take it away. The world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. Hell didn't give it, and hell can't take it away. Problems didn't give it. Problems can't take it away. Hallelujah. My own salvation. This is mine. Amen. Amen. So working at our salvation with fear and trembling, you know what? It really is a lifetime of work in process. Amen. We all have gone into businesses where signs similar to this were, were hanging and that, that were, were saying to their customers or to those coming into their, to their building, please excuse our process, our progress. Please excuse our progress. Because they were remodeling or, and so there was dust or something that was missing and, and one, pa- one wall was painted one color and another wall was painted another color. But I will tell you that that what they're trying to say is this is not how it is every day, but we're, we're just progressing. We're trying to move forward. And so please excuse us as we grow. And I believe that we can have a sign like that staple to our chest and one staple to our back. And no matter how high we lift our hands or how high on the pinnacle of success we stand, we can still truthfully walk through this world and say, please excuse our progress. I am really leery of people who only want to talk about their wins and their triumphs. Because overconfidence can be as disastrous as a lack of confidence. I believe that we must all set a pace we can keep. I really mean that. And I don't mean that to sound lackadaisical at all. I've shared this illustration many years ago, or a few years ago at least. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine who had at that time been serving their congregation in the city where they were for over 20 years, a lot longer than that now. And he was talking about a lot of things. He was, it was just a kind of re- very reflective conversation. And he was being very open, very honest, very transparent. And he said, you know, I haven't accomplished a lot of things that I hoped we would have accomplished by now. I hope we would have done this, that, or the other. Very reflective moment. And then to not excuse anything at all. He's a man of great character. He said, but I, I, I will tell you, what, I'll tell you what we did do. He said, we went to this city and stayed. I thought, wow, wow, we're still standing. He's not trying to excuse any missed mark. Not trying to excuse any missed goal. But I came and I stayed. I'm going to ask our musicians to come. I have... A greater need of God today are certainly as much need of God today as I did 41 years ago when I first started preaching or many, many, many years ago when I first really started living for Him. I must have God's help today just as much or more. I need God's help today or more than I did 37 years ago when we made our full-time ministry endeavor step. All of my human effort is worthless without his power and his will within. I'm talking about me tonight, but the truth of the matter is I can hand you this microphone and you could repeat the same thing just inserting your years. We need him as much now, if not more, than we ever have. Amen. Amen. A great French surgeon was quoted as saying to every class, to all of his students, he would say to them, don't be in a hurry. For there is no time to lose. He said to his students, be sure of the incision and don't cut at it with overconfidence because he said 
If you cut at that incision with overconfidence, before you can correct your mistake, a precious life will have been lost. Amen. So don't go in there thinking, I got this. We'll just whack away here and whack away there. Before, because before you can clean up all of that, life is going to be ebbing away. And so tonight, I don't ever want to be arrogant. An arrogant Christian is so out of place. The Bible says that the Lord hates a proud look. So we need to stay humble and allow the Lord to do what He wants to do in us. I'm going to ask you to stand. Because here's what the Scripture says. For it is God that worketh in you. Look at the Look at the verbs, if you will, is and the verb worketh. They are in the present tense. So we can count on God's help now, right now. Not what God has done for other generations or what God may do in future generations. But in the present tense. Amen. We can do and we can accomplish what God has called us to do. Because he's still working in us now. For it is God that worketh in you. Amen. And that's all we need to know to have triumph in our life. And so I pray that we would activate our faith because victory belongs to us now. Amen. Let's love the Lord. Can we just receive?